Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Well, good morning. Today is Veterans Day. Um, Civic Center is hosting like a breakfast. I'm just going to get right into this. I, it's Monday. I haven't done a sermon yesterday, but I've had some sermons already like lined up for pre in advance that were like stuff I did um, before. And uh, I'm kind of behind right now. So bear with me. This stuff's going to come out kind of late. Uploading time and all that stuff. But, um, one of the biggest things that I've learned, uh, the message, today's message is about unconditional love. What do you think about when you think about unconditional love? I'll tell you what I think about. I think about, I love you no matter what. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter who you think you are, I love you. End of story. You cannot not make me not love you. At least that's the idea. I I strive for that, but that's just uh, something more in a sense of letting go, not a striving, not an obtaining. And, And that's how I feel about God anyways. Unconditional means letting go. That's how I feel. Like when I think of God, I think he just he's this he's he's not bound by anything. He's not measured by anything. He is completely unconditional. He says, I pour on the rain, I pour the rain on the just and the unjust. I forgive even sinners, you know, he says, as far as the east is from the west, as far as I've cast your sins away. I mean, the whole Bible for me, when I read it, I think of this idea of unconditional because the opposite of unconditional is conditional and conditional means you have to do this, this and this and this and this and then I will accept you. But God just accepts us. And that's part of our human pride is just we don't understand that here because if we did we would just accept everyone we would just be always forgiving always loving but because we're fallen from this state of love everything is about works 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 earning 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 and then we even measure ourselves to others but god doesn't measure anything because he's not measured and that's one of the biggest issues in our world. When Adam fell with Eve, everything was theirs. God said it. He said, I've given you the world. It's all yours. And even Jesus says it later. He says, what's mine is yours and all things that are mine are yours. But in this sense of the world, we have to earn everything. Uh, Jesus says, I've sent you into uh, vineyards to not to labor because it already belongs to you, but you go out and labor. And what does that really mean? I mean, should that mean that we should go out and just take whatever we want? God forbid, no, because there's a 10 commandments about stealing. What I do believe is this. Our hearts are set on what we don't have versus set on what we do have. And God says true riches aren't of the physical things that you have. But you should be content with what you do have. The the true riches of God is contentment and who God is and what you see around you. Think about it. If you don't exist, you're not aware of anything. But the fact that you do exist shows that you have access to everything You don't exist. You're not aware of anything. Nothing else exists. It's just nothing from nothing from nothing. You can't get nothing. You can't get something from nothing. But the fact that you do exist shows that you were created 
and brought into being into an existence where you can perceive the world around you and you have access to indulge in things whether they are good or whether they are bad that's for you to decide but god is basically saying if you indulge in the bad it will kill your soul and then you will die and go back into being nothing but if you want more fruitfulness and more life, you will learn who I am and what, it please, what pleases me will please you. That's interesting, isn't it? What pleases God pleases us. And what pleases, you know, if we're living according to how he wants us to live, will please him. So if you do what's right, your soul will be satisfied. Your soul will be filled. I, I live in the world and I'm a cashier and I watch people go in and out of the store. And I see people multiple times a day and I see what they buy. And I'm human and I'm going to make a judgment. <laughs> and the judgment for me is this. As I even, you know, I'm off on my off time, I see the, the way people treat one another and how they live their lives. Some people come in there and they completely ignore me. Some people come in there and they're completely dis disrespectful. And there's few people who are actually kind and nice. And then some people who are kind of kind and nice, they're very gro uh, gr grotesque. Like what comes out of their mouth, the nasty jokes and all that stuff. I'm like, eh, it's not, I don't want to laugh at it. That's not funny, whatever. Um, but there are those rare few. And most of them are actually believers, believe it or not or aware of, you know, dignity, having some sort of dignity for themselves, some sort of discretion, you know, and what that comes to be is this, which kind of jumps on the topic of what last sermons should have been about, which is respect. You cannot respect others if you do not show respect for yourself. Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You cannot have dignity for others if you do not have dignity for yourself. If you see your brother naked or your sister in need or someone hurting, you cannot go over there and show them comfort or clothe them or cover them up from their shame and from their guilt. Unless you've first been clothed in your shame and in your guilt. So many times I see in this world where people point out each other's mistakes and point out each other's flaws. And the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin, sins. Love covers when love defends, love sacrifices, you know, it's a sense of love protects. But the opposite of love, which is based on conditions doesn't it actually exposes those things and what i mean by that is it wants people to feel condemned when they're guilty when they're ashamed of certain things you know i was going through some situation where basically i told someone about something because they were like well why, what's going on why do you need this da, da, da. or i felt that and i was just open with my situation and now they go around telling everybody about my situation. And I'm sitting here just like, wow, I even trusted you. And you still go around telling me, telling everyone about, you know, why I'm going through this to make me feel bad about myself. You know, oh, you should have your life in order and this and this and that. That's not what love does. What God does is he clothes us. Could you imagine walking in the world or just all your secret, your, your dirty secrets just spread out for everyone to see. And the world is this way and it's nasty and grotesque because they pretend that they have no problems when they do. And Jesus says, as believers, we should tell each other our sins. We should confess to each other, confide in each other of our sins and, and, and because we need, we need help. He, Jesus said, I came to save those who are sick, not those who think they're perfect. And unconditional love is when I see my kids I'm going to love them regardless or I'm going to try my best to love them regardless of what they do you know 
And that's how God sees us. He doesn't just throw us away. Oh, you made a mistake. Get out of here. We're no longer friends. I had a situation where someone asked to switch uh, shifts with me. They're like, can you switch shifts with me? Because it's not going to work, such and such and such. And I said, well, the shift that you want to switch with me, first off, um, I need the hours. My shift was longer. Your shift isn't. And I don't mind other than that. If it was the same amount of hours, sure. And I said, no. And it wasn't this person directly. It was asked from a third party. And the third party, other person which was there, decided to basically argue with me and say, you should do it because of this and this and this and that. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. That is my free will to choose no. And he goes on and on and on and pursues me to try to change my mind. First off, that's not love. God so loved us that he gave us free will. And he still loved us that he gave us his son. We have a choice to accept Jesus or not, or to reject him. We have a choice to do what's right or to do what's wrong. And in that moment, I had a choice. And what unconditional love does, it says, you know what? God says, I know you don't want to worship me. I know you don't want to do what I tell you to do. You actually grieve my Holy Spirit, but I still love you. And I'm still always going to be here for you, regardless of what you do. The door is always open. And this is what we need to learn as Christians. Last Sunday, I went to the church and it was pretty awesome. This other church we went to when we first got here and they were always still arms open with us. You know, if you're at a church and you don't start showing up and stuff enough because you feel whatever, that's your business. But the church, your business is to always have your arms open regardless. And we stopped going to this other church. And when we started to just see them or, you know, go to the um, whatever distribution building, they started to treat us like we're lepers. That's not how we're supposed to be. That's not how I'm supposed to be with my kids. And that's not how our God is. Our God always has an open door policy. He still loves us unconditionally because basically what you're saying is this, including the, um, what happened to me at the job, they started arguing with me and why I should switch. And the fact that I said, no, they said, oh, we're gonna talk bad about you. We're gonna gossip about you and this and this and that. Well, that shows that you had a condition in the first place. And the fact that I didn't go back to that church, they did the same thing. Oh, we're going to start talking bad about you. We're going to start mistreating you. I had a girl in high school. She was very young. She was a freshman. I was a senior. I was graduating. I didn't even want to talk to her because I was going to graduate and go to the military, which I did. And I don't want any strings attached. And yes, it was kind of one of a little regret that I had in my life, but whatever. I mean, I was pretty much older than her a lot. So, but she hit on me and hit on me and hit on me and hit on me and stalked me. And finally, I didn't ever gave in. And she started to talk bad about me and tell other people that I was gay and this and this and this and that. You see, and that's the way this world is. When I got fired at one of my jobs over here, over at Dunphy Exit, y'all know what I'm talking about. Once I got fired, suddenly I, I just messaged the boss and said, hey, no hard feelings, this and this and that. I'm sorry for what happened. It was a pleasure working with you. They didn't say anything, which is their choice. That's OK. But with that being said, some of you guys, a lot of you guys, actually every one of us, we have a problem with unconditional love. We can't love people after an affliction after a, a dispute, after a disagreement. And that's not the God that we serve. And as Christians, we should not be that way. But Jesus says, those who have been forgiven much, love much. And those who have been forgiven little, love little. So the fact that you don't show this, con uh, uh, this unconditional love to others because you still have strife because they didn't do that what you wanted or you had a disagreement shows that the love of God does not abide in your heart. Jesus says, I loved you. You are a sinner. I loved you even when you sinned, as you still sin against me today. If you've done, if you've done anyone wrong, you've done me wrong. And you ask for forgiveness for me, but you don't forgive your neighbors. You see, the talents, as far as the talents is concerned, the parable about the three people he gave, one, ten, another five, and another one, it shows trust. You know, I've given you a job 
That job isn't your job because you earned it or you even deserved it. The fact that you're created doesn't even show that you deserve to be created, but I created you anyways because I unconditionally loved you, knowing that you would do the wrong thing, knowing that you will probably walk your life into hell. I loved you anyways, and I gave you free will. Whether you respect one another or not is your choice. All of you have a choice to repent and to seek God. And the fact that you're not shows that you love evil more than you love what is good. And that's OK, because that's you going to hell, not me and not anyone else, unless they choose that along with you. But God so loved the world that he sent his son to show us the right way. God said the, the lamb, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. None of us have an excuse on the day of judgment. You can't make up an excuse and you can't blame your your life on anybody else when you stand before God and give an account of everything that you said and everything that you did. Well, why didn't you love this person? Because Jesus is not going to measure it between. Well, they didn't love them. They didn't do this either. You're not measured by each other. You're going to be measured by Christ because Christ came in this world and he did love everybody, even when they crucified him. And you're going to have to compete with that. That's going to be terrible for you. And I'm sorry for you. Shoot, I'm sorry for myself. The more I see Christ, the more I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm terrible. I am not a good person. And I feel don't I, I now understand what Jesus says when he's walking up the uh, Mount Golgotha or whatever. And the woman is, is crying and weeping for him. And he says, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. And I feel that now. Yes, I suffer throughout this this world and whatever and sacrificing and all this stuff at work and all this stuff that I don't like, whatever. But the more I see God, the more I know that it's going to be it's not going to be worth whatever I'm suffering here and what what the next life is going to be like. But the people that I look at, they don't even know Christ. They don't even care. If anything, they even blaspheme him. And they're living their life all luxurious and awesome here. And I'm like, I feel bad for you. Someone tried to show me empathy yesterday or sympathy or whatever. They're like, you know, it's hard day. And I'm like, not as hard as it's going to be for you. Not as hard as it's going to be for all y'all. Y'all don't even care or know about Christ and his unconditional love. He says, I spread, I open my arms out daily and no one comes to me. But those who are wise, they come to me. This, st this stuff, you don't own anything here. It's not yours. It's not my phone. It's not my camera, not my clothes, not even my body. When I got baptized with Jesus, I don't own anything. That's not my wife. That's not my kids. I'm a steward of these things. God has given me these um, talents to take care of them. And if I don't take care of them, He's going to take them away from me. Some of you guys now will tell this much. I know a woman who had multiple kids. She didn't take care of her kids. She actually abandoned her kids and went on to drink. No, her kids don't even visit her anymore. She doesn't even, she says she claims that she loves her kids. But if she did, why don't her kids love her? Did she have enough respect and dignity for herself? She didn't spend no time with her kids, rarely any. And now her kids are someone else's kids. They don't even come home and visit her anymore or their parents or their fathers. What do you have to show for at the end of this life? Do you have a big family? Do your family know that you love them? Where are they? You have a big house. You have all these nice cars, but nobody wants to visit you. Nobody likes you. There's a problem with our hearts. God even loves the evil people, which is us. But regardless of that, he still shows us grace. He still shows us mercy. He still clothes us. He still feeds us. Even while we're sinners, Christ died for us. And that's, the, that's what it means to be a Christian. It's just like, I don't deserve none of this. I don't even deserve to be created. But I complain. We live in a nation where we're entitled. We complain about the job. 
man, if, if as much complaining as I see at the jobs that I work at, I'd fire every single one of them. Ungrateful. America is an ungrateful country in comparison to the rest of the world. We're ungrateful for our families, our friends, our parents. We're ungrateful for the jobs and the clothing on our back. We are rich, but yet we're poor. We don't love each other here as much as we other countries do. All they got is Jesus and they love the heck out of each other. And that's the key thing. We should love each other more than we love this world or the things in this world. But you have not love in your heart to love your neighbor. I got people coming in my line disrespecting me for how I bag their stuff. I had a man over here at the laundromat when I went and did my laundry and I and it was a big it's a big. um, How do you describe it? It's a big dryer machine. So I just throw all my clothes in there. I'm not trying to spend all this other extra money on it. And I go in, I say, well, the laundry thing uh, went out of service or whatever to the lady there. And she's like, let's take a look. So she gave me my change back and I said it was like 54 minutes. And she looked and then a guy came in after her who was like the maintenance guy. I guess he was the owner as well. And I'm like, see, and, for, and this guy behind me, I'm off. I get disrespected all the time. I'm not working right now. You know, I'm doing this for my family. Da, 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 da. It's cheaper for us to every once in a while go to the laundromat than us to try to find or pay and invest in whatever and have our own. So I'm going in. I'm going in there. And this with her and this guy follows who who's the owner and the maintenance guy. And he's just like, that's why, because you have too much effing clothes in there and effing this and this and this and effing this and this and this. Couldn't even look me in the face and say those things, of course, because when you blaspheme against one another, you can't even look each other in the face. And that's how I know y'all judge me. It doesn't even matter. I don't even care. I look, I walk, I come through the store, I work at the store and people don't even look me in the face when they come and say whatever they got to say. Because we're made in the image of God. <clears throat> With that being said, he goes and, and I say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's just, oh, oh, and he walks out. And something just triggered, triggered in me. You know, I'm a vet. And <laughs> that's nothing in comparison to what I did or what happened to me or what I did. But when I got out of the military, I said this. I said, I ain't never going to let nobody treat me like that again, ever. Some told me that I shouldn't do it, but I did it anyways. But the love of God came in and rescued me in that moment. I got my laundry. I was so just like, I can't believe that happened. You know what I mean? I was just there to do my laundry. I never deal with anybody there. You know what I mean? And I was like, I got my laundry and I left and I was putting it in the car. And as I was getting in the car, I just it just snapped. And I walked back. I walked back in the office where I got the lady where he came in and I saw him, too. He turned around. He said, did you find everything OK? And I said, actually, no, I didn't. And he said he was as he was about to say something else. I didn't even I just didn't even stop. I looked him in the face and I said, I don't want to be treated like that. I'm not coming here again because I don't want to be treated like that. And some of you guys are going around disrespecting everybody. Disrespecting everybody saying, oh, who's going to show me respect? Who's going to do it? Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go around showing people respect? We live in a rebellious world. Rebellious. There's no reverence for each other. There's no honor for one another, for bosses or nothing. All I hear is complaining about my boss. Complain, 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 complain. You have a job where you can feed your, 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 your family and do these things. This boss who could have hired anyone else, he hired you. And you go and you disrespect your boss. If you disrespect your boss, I guarantee you disrespect your parents. But you walk around accusing everybody else to respect you, but you go around disrespecting everybody. That means you have no respect for yourself. And you damn sure, excuse my language, have no respect for God. Oh, they owe me this. I come in here and I clean and I do all this stuff. Man, you, I'll fire you right now. You're lucky you don't work for me because you'd be gone. 
Because that's I did that in the military, man. You'd be doing push-ups all day. But you know what? Now I get our parents. I didn't like them at first. Now I get it. Now I get the authorities. And Jesus says this. He says, they're going to hate you. You know why? Because they hate what's good. I have this girl. She comes in there. She works there every once in a while. First off, she don't need the job. She comes there. Work all, she comes in there. She doesn't even work. She just sits there all day. And all she says is, you know, I'm working hard. You know, I'm working hard. It's sarcastic because she's not working hard. And when I'm working hard, because I get in trouble when I'm not working, I'm not held accountable by you guys. I'm not held accountable just to be a little better than this or even to my boss. I'm held accountable by God. And if I got to work hard to keep clothes on my back and my children's back and my wife's back, if I got to do these things and to have fear of the Lord and to work hard, Martin Luther King said this. He said, if you're a street sweeper, you better sweep that street like Michelangelo painted. If you're a garbage disposal person, you better take out garbage like uh, Mozart composed music. And all that you do, even the littlest things, you better do it to the best of your abilities. But so much of us this day, we just want a job where we can sit on our hands and do nothing. And we wonder why our life sucks. Well, I'll tell you what, your life sucks because what you put in is what you get out. What you sow is what you reap. You don't have good friends because you don't invest into people. And you don't invest as much into people. If your church is shrinking, if your business isn't growing, it's because what you put in is what you get out. But we go around complaining about everybody else and being like, oh, I did this one masterpiece and I do in this and I'm the greatest whatever and everyone should adore me. Well, guess what? You're not a child anymore and you're going to get some criticisms that you're not going to like. Shoot, I get criticisms. And that's the difference between a follower and a leader. A leader can take the fire, take the heat and be refined by it. Whereas the coward would jump out and hide behind someone. They hide behind lies. They hide behind deception and all these things. But I tell you, if you want to be a leader, you have to jump out in the fire and stand there and burn. And get burned. I ain't here to make friends when I'm working at this job. I'm here to take care of my family and to serve God. I'm not here at this church to make friends. I'm here to serve God and do the best of my abilities. The church has turned into a clique. And I'm not part of a clique. I'm part of God's mission. Yes, it's important to be part of a family. But if your brother or your sister or your uh, fellow servant is falling into sin, I rebuke him. I rebuke my wife. I rebuke anyone and everyone so as long as I gain Christ. But that's the world that we live in. We live in man pleasing world. They please one another. I'm not looking for your acceptance. I'm looking for Jesus. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for God's acceptance. And if I'm accepted by him, I don't need to be accepted by anybody. And that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing because we want to be loved. But you're never going to find it in this world because they're always going to change. We love you when you have purple hair. Nah, we love you when you have blonde hair. We love you when you have money or when you give us money. Oh, we love you when this and that and the other thing. I ain't no monkey and I ain't in no zoo and I ain't jumping around for nobody in no circus. The only person I jump loops for is my God in heaven. Because he's the only one who can save my soul. And he's the only one who can save yours. But the fact that you don't fear him, I'm sorry. But if you do fear him, you better get to know him more. You better seek him. Your desire to seek him should be more. You should be reading your Bible more. You should be praying more. You should be praying for your enemies more. I want to know you more because nothing in this world I desire beside you for all of it is trash. It's all fading away. It's all passing. Even my body is dying. Your bodies are dying. 
And I used to seek these things in the world, but they do not satisfy. And I look at the people in this world and they eat it up. They eat it up like they've never eaten anything before. When I mean eat it up, I mean they just digest all the media that they see. They just hear everything that they hear. They can't they don't have enough ears to hear everything, but they listen to every little thing. They, li- they watch all this content, all that garbage going in your mind, all that garbage going in your ears, going down your heart. But you won't pick up a Bible. You gain the whole world. You have all the clothes you want, all the shoes, all the things that you want in this world. But one thing you don't have is a satisfied heart. You drink all the things you want. You party all the time. But guess what? Your heart is getting more and more smaller, more and more corrosive. And now you weep and gnash and complain about everything. It's terrible. It's terrible. Jesus came to prune those things. He came to make a tree into a spear. He wants you as sharp as he is, as trained as he is. A warrior goes out into battle, he trains before he goes or she. You should be training, sharpening your sword every day, getting ready. I'm getting ready for God every day. This is another day that God gave me. This is all preparation for judgment. Love your neighbors. Do what the Bible tells you to do because you fear the Lord. Do not fear me. Fear God. You cannot love your neighbor if you do not love yourself. You cannot correct your neighbor if you're not first corrected. You should go get a job if you don't have a job. You cannot tell someone else to do the right thing if you're not living in the right. Jesus doesn't want no hypocrites in his kingdom. You cannot tell people to serve more if you don't serve, to do to bless more if you don't bless. And I almost fell into that a little bit. And when you bless, you compete against each other. Doesn't that show that you are not mature in Christ? Why are you competing against your neighbor? You should be competing against God. You're not going to be held accountable. They're not going to be standing next to you on Judgment Day. And for those of you who don't think that Judgment Day is coming or that God is the only true God, well, guess what? You got another thing coming and it's going to be too late by then. What do you do when no one is watching? What do you think when no one sees your thoughts? It's all unconditional. God has laid his arm. I unconditionally love you. But you're giving me all these commands and guidelines. My unconditionalness means that I allow you free will to do what's right or to do what's wrong. And if you do what's wrong, you will not come into heaven with me because you have an unconditional choice to do what's right or to do what's wrong. Jesus laid his life down. He had free will to do whatever he wanted, but he sacrificed his free will in obedience to what God wanted. Yes, you can live however you want to live. That's God's unconditional love towards you. I created you. And I've given you free will to do whatever you want. But if you want to know what true love is, you will sacrifice your control over your life. And you will lay them at my son's feet. And he will take over your life. And you will live in obedience. And I live as a pleasing aroma, as a pleasing living sacrifice. You will offer your body and your lives to me. God says, jump, jump. God says, this, this, do this. That's all what this Christian walk is about. And y'all have not come to be a Christian because y'all love rebellion. And frankly, rebellion is darkness. And darkness is hell. I thank you for watching, but guess what? Let me end on a positive note. God still loves you. And it's not too late as long as you're still here on earth. Today is the day of salvation. It's the same message every single day for all eternity until the day you die for every generation. And it's still here waiting for you. 
Jesus, I need you in my life. Forgive me for I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and guide me into the steps of righteousness and peace. You ain't got to say that word for word. But Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me, God. Please come to Christ. Please, I cannot beg you enough. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Come to God. Surrender your life. Give your life. Repent to God. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. God loves you. He loves you so much. No one can love you. No one can love you like God loves you. I thank you for watching. God bless.